This is episode 20 of the Immunology Podcast, Mucosal Immunology with Dabrowski Herbert. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rad. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. Today we have Dabrowski Herbert from the University of Pennsylvania on the podcast to talk about his research exploring the immunoregulatory and regenerative mechanisms operating the mucosal surface, which again is the most important surface. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... Stem cell technologies would like to remind everyone about the Immune Regulation News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by the Stem Cell Science News Program, covering research on the regulation, suppression, and modulation of the immune system. Immune Regulation News keeps readers current with the latest news, research, policy, events, and jobs relevant to the immunology community. Subscribe for free at www.immuneregulationnews.com. I do like the, the newsletter. I follow it. It's very good. Well, how are you, Brenda? Yeah. Hi, excited about our uh, last episode of the year. We made we it. We did. This is uh, episode 20 already, which is kind of crazy. And this is our last episode for the listeners until January 18th, where we'll be back with a brand new episode. So don't worry. It's just a short break. But, you know, we don't want to have our T cells exhausted either. And so we need some vacation ourselves. So where are you doing, Brenda? Anything exciting? For sure. Uh, well, I am planning on going uh, to Italy between uh, for New Year's uh, to a friend's house. So hopefully that can still happen. Uh, and yeah, and I'll be talking probably next time from sunny Argentina. Isn't that fun? That's, that's impressive. Um, I'm going to Hawaii. No way, really. Yep. My uh, parents awesome. have a condo there, and everyone's like, oh, you're going to Hawaii? That's crazy. I'm from the West Coast originally. Lots of people go to Hawaii when they're on the West Coast of the United States. It's not that far. It's like people on the East Coast going to Florida or the Caribbean. But I am now hauling right. two kids on about 18 hours of flights to Hawaii. It's, it's, a, it's a thank you gift to the grandparents because they saved our butt during the pandemic by doing a bunch of transporting of children and other such things um, so that I could write grants and get jobs and, you know, hang out in an ICU during the pandemic. So they really want the kids to come. We bit the bullet. We're doing the Hawaii thing, doing all the things. Got helicopters, luau's, uh, deep sea fishing, stargazing. Are you going to see some observatories in you Hawaii? You can't go right up all the, the way. Um, one, the main one oh. that's really high up is at high altitude, and it's robotic as a result and just viewed from down at, you know, sea level. Uh, two, I have oh. kids that are too young to go above 9,000 feet safely. Oh, I didn't know there was like a rule for so kids. So kids, fun oh. fact physiologically, um, are, their cardiac drive is more respiratory dependent. That's why if you look at CPR for adults, it's just chest compressions. They get rid of the whole airway breathing thing. But for kids, it's still about clearing oh. the airway first. Because if you hold a kid's nose and mouth shut and tell them to stop, and stop their breathing, their heart will stop because they're wired physiologically different. And kids, younger kids still have their cardiac outputs more dependent on their breath. And breathing and oxygen saturation so they don't have quite the same physiology and can't tolerate going to higher uh lower oxygen concentrations as easily so basically they're, wow. they're canned at ten thousand. they can't go above nine you learn something new every day you're such a such a well-prepared parent jason i'm I'm well, impressed. A medical degree makes you pretty good at parenting. I did indeed <laughs> spend extra time on the uh, neonatal unit to learn how to do diapers before we had my first kid. I appreciate that. I appreciate so did my that. wife. When I grow up, I want to be like you, Jason. I'll always be at an so, angle when you change the diaper because they pee. A very important life hack for our listeners. All right. Enough about uh, neonatal pee. Why don't we get down to business? What papers do you have for me all right. today? Well, since since it's all things Omicron, Omicron, however we want to debate calling it, um, I do have a COVID paper today. This one is TREM2 is a sensor and activator of T-cell response in SARS-CoV-2 infection. First author is Yang Jian Wu. Last author is Zi Hong. It came out in Science Advances on the 8th of December. So... This was a lot of new things for me. Um, there's apparently a receptor called triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells 2 called TREM2, which is induced in T cells. 
in the blood and lungs of patients with COVID-19. And it's interesting because it binds the COVID membrane protein, the M protein, through its immunoglobulin domain. So unlike a lot of antigen-presenting processes and receptors where it, the spike protein is a be-all, end-all, this is the membrane protein. So it's a completely different target, which means it'll have different, completely different mutational implications and immune escape implications. And then it activates the CD3 ZAP, 3DC uh, Delta slash ZAP, 70 complex, leading to STAT1 phosphorylation and TBET transcription. Um, but key point, if you lose this pathway, you have worse COVID activation. The pathway has been considered, the TREM2 pathway has been considered in other reports apparently to be immunosuppressive, but apparently in some situations it's immune activating, as in this one. Um, so I was trying to understand what's the really big deal. Okay, found a receptor here that does something with COVID. So the key highlights of this that they go through are one, uh, membrane protein, membrane protein, membrane protein. So it, it's picking that up, binding it through the immunoglobulin domain, and they show that it's the membrane protein in the immunoglobulin domain of TREM2 that's being presented as the complex for further immune activation. So that's key to know, and they map that all out very cleanly with a series of experiments, breaking it down in each step of where, you know, co-immune precipitation, using fragment molecules, showing what part is binding to what. So that was well done. Then... They make this key finding, which I don't, I didn't know was interesting, but that is why a well-written discussion is important because if you're spinning up on a field, you don't quite get what something is implicated, is that um, the, this receptor was originally identified in innate receptors. It's been somewhat found on lymphoid cells and activated cells, um, but they're the first times this shows that it's induced on T cells and then really key in that it's induced in relation to COVID, um, which is new. So understanding that it has this extra role in T cells serves to tone and activate the T cell response and is basically an antigen presenting molecule for activation by CD3 of the membrane protein as opposed to the spike protein are all kind of why um, this paper is exciting. I think it's interesting mostly because it's providing a different um, antigen that the body can respond to in terms of COVID. So it's not just spike protein, spike protein, spike protein, because we, as we know, that thing seems to be mutating a lot lately. And so, yeah, that's where I'm at on this one. I thought it was a good read in terms of getting some understanding of other like host pathways that are involved in understanding viral infection that we hadn't thought about before. I think I missed something. This is a epitope from the the mem transmembrane it, it packages an epitope of the transmembrane so trem2 has an immunoglobulin domain on the outside of it and packages the membrane protein in it and then presents that to activate by cd3 slash zap 70. Oh. okay that's a very interesting kind of completely different layer of stimulation yeah the fact that there's mm -hmm. this receptor protein with um immunoglobulin domain. I mean, I will say if I had to pick one thing to pick upon with a part with this paper, it could use a picture of the protein or something for people who aren't innate like TREM experts, which I am not. Mm -hmm. So I was like, TREM what? Immunoglobulin <laughs> who domain? What is this protein? It right. is a little weird to me. Um, but yes. And do they do they uh, kind of conclude that this, this uh, pathway is also affecting the immune response in humans? Yes. So they can see that it correlates, um, where would they pull this? So one, if you do a mouse model and you nuke uh, TRAM, uh, they don't do as well. So if you use a mouse model of COVID infection, which is a different virus, but same concepts, if, um, if you get rid of TRAM, the mice do not do as well at all. Um, I don't think they were able to connect this to people at this point. Mm. Um, oh. So they see downstream signaling molecules that activate in TREM uh, that is also true in patients. So they see at least right. the pathway appears based on downstream pathway signaling that it's important in patients as well. All right. I'm trying to remember. Okay, so and then, they, and then the, this, all the study work was done in um, patients with COVID. So they, they, they mapped out the TREM2 in patients with COVID, but they couldn't do the downstream implication, right? So they, all this was done in patient samples infected with COVID. Um, 
showing at least part of it. And then they did more mapping afterwards, obviously. But they identified TREM2 in COVID patients being important for signaling, but then showed that, okay, you can't obviously knock out a gene in people. That's no, no, no. So they showed the, the implications of that in the mouse model, but then also showed that the signaling cascade was important in patients. They, they did as All best right. as they okay. could without, I... you know, CRISPRing some people for fun. Interesting. And I guess I can continue on the COVID um, topic. Oh, boy. Because um, today I have a little bit of a smorgasbord of preprints and Twitter, science Twitter. I've been trying to get the freshest of the fresh uh, Omicron data for our listeners. So bear with me here a little bit. I'm going to talk about a, a publication that has been uh, submitted to MedArchive yesterday. Uh, so, uh, so the day before we're, we're recording this and comes from the Rockefeller University from a collaboration of the labs of Paul Bienas, Michael no uh, Nussensweig and Theodora Hessianu. Uh, first authors, Fabian Schmidt, Frauke Mwich and Jiska Weisblum. And they are, have clearly very quickly got down to testing how does the pre-existing immunity uh, work on Omicron variant spike protein? And so it's been, it's a very interesting study. As I said, it's not peer reviewed yet. So I think I'm cheating a little bit here, but I thought it was really, uh, this is very, uh, has been causing a lot of uh, conversation in the community. I think it's nice to talk about. So basically what they do, they, they had a, they have a, um, um, large database, a large uh, collection of serum from patients uh, and, and donors of, of different stages of uh, COVID immunity. They have some from people that are convalescent that have been infected with COVID uh, and some people that have been vaccinated. And they have people like uh, different stages of vaccination, two vaccinations, a booster, non-vaccinated, vaccinated with Pfizer or, or mRNA vaccines, vaccinated with J&J. &J. And they use this and they evaluate the neutralizing uh, titer of all the sera against uh, the um, Omicron variant spike protein, which uh, it's important to kind of keep in mind that as probably our listeners heard, is very quite highly mutated. It has uh, about 32 of the about 50 uh, non-synonymous changes in uh, this uh, COVID variant are located on the spike protein. And when the authors start uh, kind of their work with is comparing with a spike, an artificial spike protein that ha they had been, uh, they had designed previously, which uh, they call the PMS20 that has 20 uh, mutations that make it very good at uh, evading uh, pre-existing uh, antibody immunity. And they show that this Omicron variant actually has uh, several of these mutations that they had previously um, pre predicted to be reduced neutralization is actually present in this Omicron spike. So what I think they did, a kind of a big service to everyone, is by looking at the neutralization titers for all of these different patients against Omicron. And there's good news, there's bad news, and there's good news. What do they see, basically? So what, what's, the, what's the data telling us here? They show that um, basically full vaccination, i.e. two mRNA vaccines or one J&J &J vaccine, quickly loses, doesn't have a really high neutralization capacity against Omicron. It keeps a fairly, a fairly acceptable neutralization tire against the original virus, but not Omicron or these PMS20 uh, spike that they construct. What they see is that there's two groups of patients that show a higher level of uh, neutralization, which is either boosted participants that have a third dose after the, the two dose and uh, several months after the, their first initial two doses, or interestingly, uh, convalescent patients, patients that had first been infected, then had full vaccination. Those are, interestingly, the ones that show the highest titers 
in basically all conditions and for almost all patients. Uh, so it does look like uh, natural infection in this case provides more durable um, neutralizing titers. Um, what I thought was very interesting is that they also show they have so they have the, the, the titers for all these patients and they show that in the case of the J and J vaccine, one dose, basically there's no neutralization of either of these alternative spikes, which is not great, I would say, for those with J and J. Um, but they basically show or they kind of conclude this the, the work by saying that booster shots do help increase neutralization significantly. Uh, and so I guess that in the end, that is basically the, the suggestion of the authors get boosted. It's a little bit scary to see how low the, the, the titers go um, without the, the booster, but I, it is a, there's a little bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And I also want to say, talking about lights at the end of the tunnel, uh, something that I did not have the time to read because I just found it, a paper from Andrew Red and Aaron Tobian from John, Johns Hopkins, in which they show, they examine epitopes that are uh, dominant epitopes for T cells in, uh, for, against SARS-CoV-2. And in their analysis, they found that the great majority of immuno immunogenic epitopes that are recognized by T cells in patients that are, uh, that are uh, immune against or have immunity against the original or against the vaccines, actually, they don't change much in Omicron, which suggests that the pre-existing T cell immunity is probably not that much affected because those epitopes are not mutated. The epitopes that are mutated seems to be more, re more related to neutralizing by antibodies than T cell responses. So that's also nice. Also a preprint and bioarchive. Uh, so that's kind of the latest on this. So, so that got to my question, because if you look at what the initial data coming out, it suggests that Omicron is definitely not more severe. And that's all based on, you know, T cell immunity and cellular memory. Um, and so I'm wondering why we as people are running around freaking out about neutralizing antibodies to respiratory viruses when we know that respiratory viruses writ large mutate overcome neutralizing antibodies over and over again, which is why people get the common cold more than once in their life. And COVID is a coronavirus is one of the families that cause common colds. And uh, we don't maintain high titers in our bodies of neutralizing antibodies mm -hmm. to respiratory viruses, generally speaking. And yet, like, we're all stuck on this universe of neutralizing antibody, neutralizing antibody, neutralizing antibody. I agree you, the boosters and other yeah. things help, but... That's the whole point of everyone getting an annual flu shot, and yet also the fact that these vaccines really do prevent you from dying from the bad, bad COVID and make it more like just a normal illness, which is kind of the whole point. And that's all the T-cell immunity, which you just said seems intact, and which the other clinical data also supports. I think that I, I so I was listening to a discussion about that, and I think that the, the point that cannot be uh, ignored is that E, a small, even a small percentage can be big if it comes from a big number. So my, my point being, it is true that even if we see a much reduced mortality rate, but if we all of a sudden have a lot more people getting infected, maybe the absolute numbers will not look that good. So I guess that is the risk of this variant. But I, I agree that it's, it's, it's really hard to find, not to strike a balance. I mean, because like we're on well into year two, we're hitting into year three of this soon. And there's always going to be a new variant and there's always going to be the need yeah. for a booster every year for variants to help get neutralizing antibodies up. Because guess what? It's just a new bug like the flu. And also, and this is going to is a segue to my upcoming, my next paper, are neutralizing antibodies in blood serum what we need? Or neutralizing antibodies somewhere else. All right. The ones Take the segue and then I'll finish it off at the end with something else. Go. All right. So, Jason, in your ex expertise, what is the antibody you want for a respiratory infection? IgA. Precisely. So I have a beautiful IgA paper 
from the lab of uh, Akiko Iwasaki and at, at Yale. Beautiful work comparing intranasal priming, intranasal infection or vaccination against uh, interperitoneal uh, mode for, for mice. And they really show beautifully how, what are the, what a striking difference it makes to vaccinate these mice through the nose. So let me get you, let me walk you through it. So intranasal priming induces local lung resident B cell populations that secrete protective mucosal antiviral IgA, is the paper published in Science Immunology. And basically, the, the, the basis of the paper is they compare immune responses in mice that I are uh, immunized or they are exposed first, infected with a uh, viral influenza strain derived of the H1N1, is known as APR8, which is mouse adapted, so they infect mice either intranasally uh, or via IP, and they look into the uh, humoral response and the B and the, and the generation of memory B cells. And what do they see? They have this two, this method, they either do one intranasal uh, uh, in or inf infection with, pay attention to the numbers, 20 to 30 plaque forming units, or the alternative is four times four million plaque forming units IP. So that is the two, the two regimens that they have. And they see that in all cases you can detect IgG, uh, immunoglobulins in the in the serum of these mice. It's comparable between the two types. But then when you're looking into the 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 ball, into the 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 the, the lung, the production into the lungs of uh, of immunoglobulins, you see that IgA is much higher induced, much more induced in mice that have been infected via intranasal uh, uh, spray. And the production of um, the, the secretion of IgA and the numbers of memory B cells right there in the, in the alveolar tissue, much higher if doing intranasal vaccination. And these the cells are really tissue resident. They have, uh, they have a transcriptome that really looks very closely, very similar to T cell resid uh, tissue resident cells. They also, if they, they can show their tissue resident because they, when they're stained, for example, with a CD45 intravenous before, uh, before killing the mice, they can show that these cells are not in contact with the, with the bloodstream because they don't stain with these antibodies. And they show that also very nicely done with parabiosis experiments. They can show that although if you have one mouse that is uh, immunized, by uh, with using this nasal spray uh, uh, manner, you if you if you put two mice, the naive parabiotic partner, although it does receive and does equalize the amounts of um, immunoglobulins in the serum, they do not acquire the same levels of IgA in the lung as their uh, their their immunized partners, and they don't get any of these cells that are tissue residents in the immunized parent uh, partner. So they really show that. By doing, by doing intranasal, vaccine, intranasal exposure, you are specifically uh, inducing a population of resident tissue B cells that are memory B cells that can um, produce a lot of, can uh, induce a production of a lot of IgA that is protective in the lumen of the, of the lung. There's a show that CXCR3 is required for these B cells to migrate to this, to this uh, place, so CXCR3 uh, knockout mice, uh, so the in B cells are have deficiencies in this protection. And what I think is really interesting is a collaboration with Florian uh, Kramer, which I also want to talk something very quickly about paper that is uh, associated to this one. They have a uh, they have a, a adju adjuvant adjuvanted recombinant influenza neuraminidase vaccine, and they apply it to this patient, so this to this mice. And they, it has a, a poly IC as an adjuvant. And again, they can show that this vaccine 
intranasally can really uh, pr uh, induce a lot of IgA production and in the lungs of the mice. And it's protective to some extent against both homologous and heterologous uh, viral uh, infection with a different uh, influenza strain. And that this, uh, they, can, they, they can mediate T cell independence, memory, independent memory responses if, if they deplete T cells upon re-challenge. So this really is the B cells that are mediating the protection from infection. Very interesting, a very interesting, very elegant study. Uh, and I just want to say that then also from the, so from the lab of Florian uh, Kramer from Mount Sinai, they also just published in MedArchive a uh, effective, so very interesting about mucosal immunology, mucosal immunity in patients that were infected with SARS-CoV-2 is much superior to patients that were only vaccinated intramuscularly. And they can see that in the saliva of these patients, they can find IgA, anti-spike IgA, but not in patients that were only um, vaccinated, only vaccinated, not exposed to the virus. So again, I think it's fascinating to see we need to move, clearly we need to move to the mucosal immunity. And there's actually, for example, a couple of vaccine candidates, I think we spoke about them a couple of episodes ago. And for example, there seems to be a promising vaccine candidate for McMaster University in Canada. They're moving into phase one. There's also some preliminary data from these people. So I, I do think that 2022 is going to be the year we get a nasal COVID vaccine. I really hope 2022 is the year. And I would just like to say again, because immunology is the best immunology. I have to, yeah, I cannot agree. Uh, are you going to save us all right now? Clearly, yeah. I really hope so. I mean, I'm getting very excited. It's good. I mean, uh, you know, about this, IGA can be the unsung hero, and hopefully, uh, we get to see something happen finally with it. Because you know, an IGA vaccine yes. would really be a, another quantum leap. Think of all the innovation. Oh, happening maybe from yeah. a pandemic. Yeah. Or maybe maybe even uh, like influenza vaccine that it's spray instead of having to go and. Well, well uh, they have the spray, but it's a live one, and it. People didn't like it. Yes. Yeah. But it's not that good for young children or for older uh, people. So it has to be something a little bit more uh, safe and more immunogenic, I guess. All right. Well, to end to end on our uh, doom and gloom, I have something worse than COVID. Is there something worse than COVID? Well, I don't remember a time it before. It doesn't spread as well, but it's way more deadly. We're going to talk about anthrax, not the band, which is a very good band, but the 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 the, the the pathogen. So I'm going to talk today about treatment of experimental anthrax with pegylated, circularly permutated, or permuted, capsule polymerase. First author is Patricia Legler. Last author is uh, Arthur Friedlander. It is in Science Translational Medicine. So really high level. The paper is actually pretty short and beautiful for that, and it really just gets to the root. Um, so one of the ways you can stop anthrax after infection is by uh, having a capsule depolymerase, which depolymerizes the capsule. It's kind of a therapy, therapeutic alternative to antibiotics. The problem is, is the regular enzymes you try to administer IP don't last very long. So there's different strategies and they combine them here. The first thing to do, the, the first thing to know about this enzyme is it auto catalyzes. So it has this auto hydrolysis mechanism and it'll chew itself apart in addition to its its activation site of its catalysis is an autocatalyst that then pops something else apart, so the, the cell wall. But based on how it's designed, it can chew itself apart. So when you do protein preps, you'd have like half your yield gone or more because it eats itself and will eat itself over time in whatever you're treating. So they did a circularly, permuted, a circularly permuted capsule where the structure of the protein is the same, but you change the read sequence such that instead of saying it going from alpha helix one, two, three, you know, instead of going in one direction from the N terminal to C terminal, you move the parts around internally so that there's a different N and C terminal sequence, but it's the same protein 3D structure. Does that make sense? So the read order is different, but the 3D conformation is the same or nearly the same. Um, so that's called circular premium. So it's circle, and you just move the things in a circular chain until you get one that folds right. So if you imagine a protein as a circle, so to speak, with this 3D structure, what order starts, you know, so maybe it starts, if there's seven 
distinct regions. You start instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you start five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. And so that's how it will, then you build this and they found that by doing this, they could have an enzyme that didn't chew itself apart with nearly the same K cat and KM. Then they found a region to pegylate it and that dropped the KM a little bit, but still, and the K cat a little bit, but still good. So they show the pegylated circularly permeated lasted a really long time too. And then they gave mice anthrax and showed that if you gave this to the mice, um, either a non-toxigenic or a fully toxigenic strain, it saved the mice essentially. So they would give it, tw uh, they would give it, uh, beginning 20 hours after infection every eight hours for two days and it saved the mice essentially. And the non-toxigenic strain, um, so the less virulent strain, all 10 mice with the treatment survived and one in 10 with the regular ones survived. And then the fully toxigenic strain, 80% survived, whereas only 20% survived with, with the control. So it basically saves you from anthrax by chewing up the, okay. the bacteria. It's a beautiful okay. paper. It's got some melting curves. It's got some circular dichroism for that. It's got some protein biochemistry, some K cats and KMs, which makes me a very happy person. And then it kills anthrax. So it's got your immunology in it. And that's awesome too. So we basically have a treatment for anthrax that really works. Yes. That's, that's kind of exciting. So they do. For, so they do. But then the, um, the pegulation is just to improve the pharmacokinetics, right? Yep. All right. So it's pretty neat. I'm pretty... I'll keep this in mind next time I get anthrax. Please don't. I know the cure is close. Curiosity will kill the cat here on this one. Yeah, I'm not going to try. But do you think it's, this would be hard? Like, what is the actual... Because this seems very promising. So uh, if you're exposed, our... you would just give an injection every eight hours for three days and you don't die. So that's pretty good for the exposures to anthrax that you would want to manage. Because we are already get So that's the... The depolymerase already is widely available. Is, is it widely available no, for anthrax not, treatment? No, this isn't a treatment that's on the market at all because the oh, depolymerase okay. isn't commercially viable because it kills itself. Ah, okay. So in action, it's not like they're improving on something that's already used, but they're making something usable that wasn't usable before. Yeah, exactly. They took this depolymerase, which can work and has been explored as a treatment, but really did the protein engineering to make it a viable therapy. All right. I'm excited to see if it actually makes it to I would, uh, yeah. I mean, I know emergency. agencies like the U.S. military really like this type of stuff. Yeah, I'm sure they get some funding for that. All right. Well, we're about to hit on vacation, but first we're going to be speaking with Dr. Dabrowski Herbert at the University of Pennsylvania. But before we get to all that, from primary human cells to cell isolation kits, culture media, supplements, and antibodies, Stem Cell Technologies provides the tools you need for every step of your immunology research. Interested in cell isolation? Use EasyCEP to isolate highly purified immune cells from virtually any sample source in as little as eight minutes. Cells are viable, functional, and immediately ready for your downstream applications. Learn more at EasyCEP.com. We're talking today to Dr. Dabrowski Herbert. He is Penn Presidential Associate Professor of Immunology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's going to talk today about work in his lab exploring the immunoregulatory and regenerative mechanisms operating at the mucosal interface. Dr. Herbert, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're very excited to hear about your research. Uh, maybe we could start a little bit with your latest, uh, one of your latest publications that you, that you have uh, in which you explore the uh, function of IL-33 in anthill helmet immunity. And you found some very interesting uh, facts here. So maybe we can start talking about that. Would you like to tell our listeners about this story you published? I'd be happy to. So interleukin-33 has garnered a incredible amount of interest because of its role in a variety of different human disease states. See, disease states that are very, very widely, you know, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, autoimmunity, infection. I mean, it, and in, not even in just infectious disease, but also um, development in the brain, so on and so forth. 
So with such a broad, you know, spectrum of and, and potential involvement, it seems like it's a really important cytokine, but it's a very peculiar one because it does not possess a signal peptide for secretion. So this has puzzled scientists for like decades more, you know, for a very long time. And our work focused on secretion, on half of it. So we addressed a controversial topic there and found something really interesting that I'll share. The other part is the sources of IL-33. So it was originally described as this barrier cytokine that gets released when uh, structural type cells die or they're damaged. So it's all alarming because it's like, when you have a brute force injury or some kind of tissue destruction and the contents of the cell leak out, it's like alert, alert. The body is saying, oh my gosh, there's a problem here because IL-33 is now in an extracellular space. So this damage mechanism of delivery here is the leading hypothesis or has been in, uh, for a very long time. Our work challenges that hypothesis and posits that particular cells like dendritic cells, which are the body's specialized cell for presenting antigen to T cells to mount T cell responses and shape T cell responses. Dendritic cells, which were previously not thought to produce IL-33, they actually make it. That's what this paper kind of nails down. And not only do they actually make it, but it's really important for shaping the T cell response. And it's really important for shaping the T cell response in as much as IL-33 in dendritic cells is delivered by a very specialized pore forming protein called perforin-2, which creates a little small hole focally at the interface between a T cell and dendritic cell and delivers small amounts, likely delivers small amounts of IL-33 right at the location where it's needed. So in sum, our paper captured two large, very controversial areas in the field of IL-33 biology and provided uh, important insight into both of those aspects. So to piggyback on that, um, with IL-33, you talk about in this paper, there's a difference between what happens with the epithelial cells and the dendritic cells. Do you think part of that's due to kind of a, a low difference of epithelial cells will activate the IL-33 pathway through the damage hypothesis so that it's, you know, broken open and that's what's inducing signal leaves? That's that exactly, that's exactly it. I'm so glad that, that you got it. That means we did something right here in the, this body of work. The damage hypothesis fits very well with epithelial cell derived IL-33 and indeed are the data in there totally support that. We knew from previous work that epithelial cells on average contain higher levels of IL-33 than dendritic cells, leading many in the field to, again, ignore or even um, um, discount IL-33 derived from dendritic cells because it's comparatively so little. But in contrast, the hypothesis is that when dendritic cells deliver that small amount, they do not die. It is not a death dependent process, correct? So just to summarize, in the case of an injury of the epithelial barrier, you have the epithelial cells that release this IL-33 that is tethered to the nucleus. So it really gives the signal of uh, destruction of these cells. So this is something that, for example, a a helmet or a, a worm would do by uh, crossing this barrier. And they activate certain cells such as ILC2s, and they are part of the immune response to this uh, parasite. But then the IL-33 that is expelled from macrophages in lower quantities and more uh, more directed, uh, um, how is it, sec secretion, not really, I guess in, we wouldn't call it a secretion, but then that is directed to a different type of cell that has an almost opposite effect, right? On the on the on this site. 
mostly we focused on dendritic cells. Here recently, we have also started to create animals that have a macrophage specific 33 deletion. Um, but the really core of this story is that under basal conditions, there needs to be a mechanism that helps to maintain T regulatory cell populations at barrier surfaces. We found that when R33 was deleted constitutively in the dendritic cell compartment, a T regulatory cell population that expresses GATA3 and ST2, which are molecules that allow when expressed on Tregs, these subsets to be particularly tuned to suppress type two responses. That's a lot of Ts. When we broke this pathway by, by deleting MIL-33 from the dendritic cell compartment, indeed, those T regulatory cells that express GATA3 were preferentially lost. We think this is because 33 acts through a mighty 88 dependent pathway, uh, as along with kinase, a MAP kinase dependent pathway to maintain cellular proliferation. So the idea is as follows. At these barrier sites, such as the intestine, dendritic cells that are patrolling around, they find the Treg that's in the gut dock. They may make a, 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 a kind of a transient docking and IL-33 is delivered to this Treg to help it maintain its proliferative capacity and also its suppressive nature. And so that, that paradigm is strongly supported by um, work from others, um, like Fiona Powery, who showed that IL-33 was signaling through ST2 was very important for the suppressive capacity and uh, of, of gut T, T regs. Um, and, and our work, in, you know, really showing that you needed perforin 2 in order to deliver that, that 33, and our work showing that when you get rid of 33 in the dendritic cells, you lose that particular Treg population. Not all Tregs, but that particular one. So my follow-up is, is, so I, I'm a signaling guy. So have you guys been able to look yet, or maybe this is a follow-up paper and you can't tell me yet, does the IL-33 receptor have like a dose response curve to it that's very noted? So for instance, if you were to throw a whole bunch of more IL-33, would you then have death responses? And so it's all about the dose or does it also have to do with the target cell and what's coupled to that receptor on the inside? Yeah, you, you know, um, we haven't done your experiment yet about titrating the dose. I All of our work right now supports the real estate paradigm, location, location, location. Epithelial cells are not migratory and they're you, you know, barrier-like. Dendritic cells, by definition, must move around in tissues and are seeking out T cells to interact with. And so it, it is likely that it has to do more with location than it does concentration. In fact, we tried to recapitulate some of our in vivo findings in vitro by giving back IL-33 and we're unable to recapitulate that in vivo phenotype. Again, suggesting that it's not just having large quantities of IL-33 in a unidirectional manner, but rather having IL-33 placed at a right place at the right time. Talking about being in the right place, the right time, maybe it would be it's a good time to ask you a little bit about your experience as your your formative years as a researcher, uh, because you 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 did something very cool in my opinion is uh, you moved uh, during your postdoc to the kind of you went to the action you were studying parasitical diseases and you thought. I need to get out of the U.S. and you went to South Africa and you were there for five years, if that's correct. Yes. Uh, maybe I don't know how that experience was for you. I don't think it's that um, common. So, is yeah. there? How was it uh, for you? That that experience. So, thank you so much for asking me about that. That experience was life 
changing. And I don't say that very lightly at all. My perspective of leaving the US at the end of 2000 was very different from that of coming back in January 06. So I was very excited to go and work on parasitological diseases in, in South Africa, for sure. Um, the lab was still very young, but it was in the Khutiskir Hospital in, um, in Cape Town. And it's, it's, so where it was placed uh, was amazing. I could see the ocean and the kite surfers while I was trying to, to get my snail colony and you know, real-time PCR at the time in my animal, because, you know, it was just, um, there was constantly the distraction of the such gorgeous uh, geography. Uh, politically, you know, the, the country in itself had only become democratic in 94. So you're talking about now being a, a young Black professional in one of the most you know, countries that was, had one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Um, the population itself was just mixing and interacting like a time of never before. It was kind of like the opening up the USSR in the 80s and Perestroika and Glasnost, you know, it's South Africa style, if you will. Um, I... I, I started dating and then did marry one of the postdocs in the lab and for a while had strongly contemplated just settling in South Africa. Um, however, that, that was not to be uh, for various just administrative reasons um, because there was a lot of, of, of uh, new hiring going on and things like that to kind of rewrite some of the injustices um, from apartheid. So it just wasn't a good time for an American trying to ascend the faculty ranks. Um, it was just so, so, there's so many different aspects of it. I, I, I would talk the rest of the time on it, but I will say that scientifically, it was also as rewarding because at that time we had mouse strains that were not present in anywhere else in the world. And um, we published a paper where I was first author um, that published in Immunity that solidified the M1, M2 paradigm. So let me just couch it for just a moment, if, you, if you'll bear with me. Prior to my work being published there, University of Cape Town, there had been one position paper by um, um, Gordon Brown and his colleagues on the possibility that there was an alternative form of macrophage activation, but there was no strong evidence for it. The work that we did in Cape Town using the Schistosoma Mansone model where mice specifically lacked the AL4 receptor in macrophages, just nailed down that M2 macrophages are very, very, very important. Um, and that, that paper probably has still has four or five hundred um, citations to this day. And um, so, in conclusion, it was a um, just remarkable time for me on a per personal um level as well as a professional level and yes all of my classmates thought i was nuts <laughs> when, when i left grad school here in the u.s most of my classmates were going to postdocs at you know at top tier universities across the country um nih and emory and you know in california you name it and I was going to South Africa and they all thought I was a little weird for that, but it paid off. You stuck to your guns and it paid off. That's, yeah. That, I mean, that's, sometimes it can be very hard to 
trust your gut or, tr- or make the decision and then allow yourself not to listen to what other people tell you. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that a lot of a researcher, particularly young researchers, can uh, relate to, to that. Yeah. I, I have a question. on Now that you mentioned the M1, M2 macrophage polarization, I'm not super in, so I'm not an expert in the macrophage field. Mm-hmm. So I usually hear what other people say, but recently there has been some controversy or some dismissal of these two polarization profiles. Um, is that something that you have an opinion about? Do you think that, that often people say that they're not as useful as sometimes people s- propose them to be as models? I think people like to have, uh, people like to be binary. We understand the binary ideology, but biology is, is not really that. Biology is a continuum that involves um, admixtures and blends and features that are alike, particularly in humans, right? And, you know, anyway, I won't go into that too far, that analogy too far. So my point is that my opinion is that the M1, M2 paradigm are extremes on a continuum of phenotypes that are context dependent. So in some instances, you know, in, in cancer, we see a mixture of M1, M2 phenotypes. Um, in some worm infections, we see a strong M2 phenotype. In some uh, protozoan infections, we see a strong, you know, M1 phenotype, but then parasites have a way of enforcing molecules of the M2 phenotype. So as you see, it, it is real. Otherwise, pathogens would not evolve mechanisms to uh, manipulate this, this balance. But I think people mustn't be t- too hard and fast. Don't be so binary with it. Yes, okay, there are different flavors of this, but it is to exist. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, people. So I, I wanted to go there with a difficult conversation, but not the binary nature and how people like to go there. I was more thinking about what you're talking about, uh, South Africa being there at a kind of monumentous time or right after, you know, a switch was pulled, really. And then uh, having also been at Penn recently and seeing what Penn's trying to do to kind of uh, solve its diversity problem in sciences. Mm -hmm. What do you think the academy writ large in America could learn from places like South Africa? Obviously understanding that the demographics and scenario are very different than here. But I I would still think there's probably lessons that could be learned and some value to be had by other people's experiences. Yeah, so I guess you're you're getting at what could perhaps we adopt, what would be a, a good aspect to take from places like South Africa? How, what are they doing really, really well Right, exactly, because like we don't think about that very well in the state about what other places do well in relation to issues like this. Right. Um, Well, it's hard for me to speak about in the the scientific realm. What are they doing really well? You know, politically. Yeah, more that realm with like like Penn's trying to solve its diversity. You know, academia writ large is trying to really solve the diversity gaps. Yeah. inequities in in our institutions and you've had a you know south africa went through a sea change and didn't didn't explode so i think there's probably yeah they did right right i think it's just you know i'm proud of what penn is trying to do you know um i've been recently empowered with some you know responsibilities that will allow me to help help the pushing of the uh, the um appreciation of diversity, but it, you know, it's, it's slow going. Um, I think most important is just giving everyone the opportunity 
to have a seat at the table as decisions are being made on well, what is the most important initiative now? How much money should go into you know, a new student group versus a DEI position chair? Um, you know, I think the, the open communication is very important and Penn is, is doing pretty well with their town hall meetings and, and things like that. Um, I don't know, I've always felt pretty comfortable at Penn rel relative and welcomed here at Penn relative to some other institutions that I've been in. You know, this is my third, third faculty uh, um, uh, position. And so I haven't always felt as welcomed and included as I have here at Penn. So I do want to make that point. Um, you know, I was a postdoc at UC in Cape Town. So I was, you know, spending a lot of time trying to get that nature, that nature paper that turned into be an immunity paper and inquiring whether I would ever be able to get promoted to become assistant professor. And actually my student was, and I wasn't because my student was uh, South African, you know, so he was given preferential treatment. So there was a kind of an affirmative action gone crazy there. Um, I don't know. That, that's a tough question. You know, it's a, it's a real tough question, Jason. Um, I figure I'd the, ask, worst case, there wasn't a good answer. But, you know, yeah. if you don't ask, you can't learn anything, right? Yeah. I have to think about that some more and maybe get back to you. Something will pop into my head, you know. Please do. Maybe Jason, you could ask him a less tough question to oh, yes. wrap up this conversation. Okay, I, I I have mine for you. All right. Drum roll, please. <laughs> if you could be a cytokine, which cytokine would you be and why? Wow. If I could be a cytokine. We can throw chemokines in there too. Just you know, really? keep, keep it broad enough for you. I would most certainly be IL ten. I wouldn't be aisle 33, unfortunately. I would be aisle 10 because you can really make things stop. <laughs> you can tell everybody to freeze, tell everybody to just slow down and wait till you're, you've evaporated, if you will. So, right. It would be it would be like having a superpower, being able to make processes stop. The cytokine superpower question. Cytokine. Superpower. <laughs> keeping the peace. Well, but maybe we could also ask on a more personal uh, level. You have you are a very successful scientist, but if you were not a scientist, what would you be? Wow. That's a really dangerous question, you know, because, you know, like I, I like to mentor on is that the way to be successful is to not think about doing anything else other than, right? If I couldn't be a scientist, I would be um, infinity, infinity, no. Um, I would probably um, be a professional diver. Okay. I love uh, scuba diving. I love diving. I love being in the water. Um, I think it would be amazing, right? I guess you and would I, still be taking deep dives into something. I would still be taking deep dives, right. And I know you didn't ask me, but if, if there was a hobby that I wanted to get involved in, but just haven't had the opportunity yet. It was most certainly hang gliding. But I don't live in, in, in Utah, Utah and these, you know, all these great open areas to catch these, um, you know, the... Sorry, did you say ha hand gliding? Hang, hang gliding, yes. Oh, okay, like those guys that jump from 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 cliffs with the yes yes all right all right yeah, <laughs> so either go very high or very low 
base jump, but you're right. So now the, the new generation calls, you know, they're base jumping, right? That's what they want to do. But, you know, back when I was a kid, it was hang gliding, you know, and trying to learn how to find the, the updrifts from the warm air off of the, you know, buttes and mesas and all that, you know, out in, out in the West. That's would be me. You could combine this though. You could hang glide and then jump off and scuba down. You could get to, you could get to some deeper dives, you know, some further out dive spots there. <laughs> I think the dude, I think the scuba diving equipment will be too, too heavy for the gliding. See, it makes no sense. Jason, please. Yeah. Unless Please. you're James Bond somehow and you have a miniature scuba diving kit, you know. Right. I'm yeah, sure yeah. there's some dude on a Red Bull promotion video or something from those extreme athletes that's done this just because <sighs> the internet has everything now. But yeah, it probably wouldn't work. So thank you very much for uh, coming in and deep diving on aisle 33 and uh, a little bit of your time in South Africa. It's an absolute pleasure. Yes, it was, it was truly a pleasure to meet the two of you and to have this chat today and i certainly hope that it is a benefit to your listeners in one way or the other absolutely that brings us to the end of our show don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers you can also reach out to us on twitter at at immunopodcast or by email at info at immunologypodcast.com the feedback or to suggest guests. Enjoy the holidays and have a happy new year.